Will we change, I suppose, springs from, in part, from something I noticed back in about 1989, 1990, when working in direct marketing, that sometimes very small things you do would have immense effects. Uh, you might do some you know, fairly complicated program for American Express where you relaunched, say, the Gold Cart brand, and that would increase response from sort of 1.3% to 1.6. And then six months later, without anybody making much fuss about it, someone would redesign the application form so the questions were in a slightly different order, and the response rate would double. And I always believed back then that there was a kind of missing science in marketing, uh, that there was a whole area of stuff that we didn't really understand and hadn't properly tested. And I'd always had this sort of lurking belief that there was something there we were missing, a kind of science for which we had no name. And didn't really know what to do with that instinct until about 20 years later, when reading suddenly books in the newly named science of behavioral economics, I realized there now was a name for this. It was called things like choice architecture, for example. And so I realized that in everything we do, if we're not careful, we can optimize everything we do, but miss a few of these very, very important things. And if you think about it, if you get everything about your campaign right, everything about the advertising, the promotion, the positioning of your product, but the choice architecture of the form with which you sign up just isn't very good, it's only half as good as it could be, then that means, with a systems perspective, that everything else you're doing is half as effective. So we have a little slogan as Ogilvy Change, which is dare to be trivial. And I suppose what you could say is this is just good complex system science. That one of the things that makes complex systems like markets different from mechanisms is that rather like meteorology, there are butterfly effects. There are very small things you can do which have disproportionately large effects. And our job as Ogilvy Change is to be in part butterfly hunters, looking for these little things that have to some extent just been ignored or not tested, either because people just think they're trivial or because um, uh, in many cases they're beneath the dignity of people to get involved in. You know, usually the design of the form or the design of the uh, pricing form or the whatever is delegated to someone with not much power and discretion. And our job is to actually elevate the importance of these things and make sure they're right. Because if we don't get these things right, everything else we're doing is much less effective than it could be. Why Singapore? Um, well, partly because I always like traveling to places where I don't need a plug adapter. Uh, so that was one of the major reasons why we decided to launch here first. But other reasons are, um, first of all, city-states, we think, are the perfect place to actually apply some of these learnings. They're places of the kind of size uh, with a you know, controlled, discrete economy, where we think that behavioral science can be of importance not only in the marketing sphere, but also in the public policy sphere. Uh, in the UK, we have a government body called the Behavioral Insights Team, known informally as the Nudge Unit, uh, which focuses on exactly the kind of experiments that we find interesting. For example, uh, changing the design of the tax form will routinely recover sort of 50, 100 million pounds more in uh, tax than previously, just by adding a couple of paragraphs to a letter, for instance. Um, and we think that obviously advanced and forward-looking governments like this one will be particularly interested in this. And I think that's true. There's also an element where I would argue that in the highly developed world, and Singapore is about as developed as you can get, I would argue that the conventional economic approach to problems has kind of run out of road, that simply continuing to optimize existing conventional economic metrics will start to bump up against the kind of law of diminishing returns. And the remaining solutions, the way to really improve things here, will be, you know, the basics are all done extraordinarily well. What you need to look at now are kind of uh, complex system solutions, or creative solutions, or highly oblique solutions, or psychological solutions to problems, uh, rather than trying to, what you might call, continue to optimize the objective measures that have been pursued very successfully for the last uh, 20 or 30 or 50 years, in this case. Um, I think you know, there are certain places and economies in the world where uh, we need to look to vastly more creative and oblique solutions to continue to improve things. Singapore is stage three of the global rollout of Ogilvy Change following uh, London and Prague. I'm now traveling on to Sydney to preach the behavioral economics gospel uh, down there. 
And we'll continue to expand. We have plans for Madrid, for example, and Barcelona. We have plans for Paris. We have plans for Chicago and New York. And we see this as very interesting in a particular way, because the beautiful thing about behavioral science is it's kind of fractal. I would say there are no rules in this business, in the social sciences and understanding how people behave. There aren't any rules, but there are patterns. Um, the most valuable thing I think we can do here is we can find patterns of human behavior in one field of marketing activity and apply it somewhere else. I'm giving a talk later on today showing exactly how you can use the insight of stripy toothpaste and people's preference for stripy toothpaste to design a better pension. And the other interesting thing about exactly this kind of approach is it doesn't confine itself to any discipline. You can use the knowledge and the insights this generates in everything from advertising to activation to direct marketing to digital to website design to search engine optimization. So it's purely a group thing. So actually, we think you know, this science patently belongs everywhere within marketing. Apart from anything else, marketing desperately needs a credible scientific voca vocabulary to back it up. I've always, I've always said for years that um, there's a great colleague of mine who said that the vocabulary of marketing is a bit like the vocabulary of astrology. It sounds fine if you're talking to fellow believers, but if you're talking to anybody else, you sound mad. And I've you know, repeatedly said, you know, it's fine amongst ourselves to talk about you know, brand iconography or whatever. If you use that kind of phrase to someone who's a CFO or someone who's, for example, an actuary, it's like going to the head of uh, thoracic surgery at St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington, and saying, we must all trust to the healing power of the crystal. Okay? It just makes you sound bonkers. So one of the most valuable things that behavioral science does is it provides marketers with what you might call a pet science. Lots of other bits of business have a pet science. Finance relies very heavily on economics for its vocabulary and its credibility. We haven't really had one of our own, and one of the reasons why being a marketer is so damn tiring is you've got to argue everything from scratch. You don't really have a body of evidence on which you can effectively rely and say, look at this QED. And we think behavioral science will provide us with that. We think that actually, as we said, we're, we're very generous. We have a very collegiate spirit. And we'll actually effectively help our competitors just as they help us. But if there's one thing we do believe is we think Ogilvy can benefit this more than, from this more than anybody else simply because of the breadth of our offering. Other agencies might be able to apply it in one or two ways. We can actually apply it in ten.